This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. On numerous occasions, I've been lucky enough to get away from the city, away from all the noise, both audible and visual. And when I was out in the desert or the mountains or in a small town with no electricity, I looked up at the night sky and was often left dumbstruck. Without the smog or the light pollution, I have been in awe of the endless pinpoints of light. I've often thought that this was the very same sky that my ancestors, whose names I'll never know, looked upon when they were alive. And I wondered if they had felt the same sense of wonder that I was feeling in that moment. The moon and the stars have fascinated human beings for hundreds of thousands of years, but it's only been in the past 60 or so years that human beings were finally able to launch themselves into the heavens and eventually put men on the moon. And as monumental as those events were, what was once deemed impossible is now considered routine. And so the evidence of those accomplishments, the launching pads, the mission control rooms, the offices, if they haven't been repurposed, they've been left to deteriorate and be reclaimed by nature. Photographer Roland Miller has made it his life's work to document these sites of the Gemini, Mercury, and Apollo space programs. His photographs, collected in his book, Abandoned in Place, reveals the inherent beauty and the historic importance of a time and place when people turned one of humanity's greatest dreams into a reality. And we pulled up, and I got out of the car, and I immediately knew that this was something that needed to be documented. You know, it's um, it's historic, and yet it was being abandoned with, with in some in, in some re- in some cases, good reason, but still, it, it, I felt like somebody you know needed to record this transition, and also I knew it would be completely amazing. I mean, it was beautiful. The you know the um, but the challenge for me then was well, how do I make this not just another picture of peeling paint? How do I push this to a different level and do service to the history that occurred here? And also tell a, a a broad story. So that I knew it was going to be difficult to do, but also extremely rewarding. Though his career was that of a photo educator and administrator, Roland used his spare time to document not only these locations, but also the American Space Shuttle Program and the ISS, the International Space Station. His collaboration with Italian astronaut Paolo Nespoli resulted in one of the most unique photographic team-ups that's ever occurred, resulting in some of the most stunning and beautiful images of the space station and of Earth. They, you know, they take pictures inside the station, but they're generally of people doing things or the experiments, and they take a lot of pictures outside the station. Paolo said he took over half a million pictures on in in five months. Now, a lot of that was time-lapse photography, so it, it sounds like a little bit more, but still, they take an immense amount of pictures. So doing something that they're not already doing was a challenge, and that's why I thought, well, if I you know, photograph the interior, and the, the purpose is that someday that space station will you know, be abandoned and deorbited and burn up in the atmosphere and be gone. So it's, there's going to be, I, I, unless they can figure out a way to bring a module or two back, I don't know if they can, but odds are that's not, not feasible. I'll talk to Roland about the many technical and logistical challenges he faced in creating images for his projects, as well as his personal technique for creating prints of these out-of-the-world photographs. Welcome to The Candid Frame. I wanted to to start um, with you painting a a picture for me. I, I want you to Describe those or that morning when your parents would wake you up in the wee hours of, of the day to get you to sit in front of the television to watch one of the fledgling 
flight launches of the U.S. space program. Walk me through that. What do you remember of that of those mornings? Well, I remember it almost always be pretty dark because a lot of the launches back then. I'm not sure if it was just timing or what reason, or but uh, they seemed to occur right around sunrise, which I lived in Chicago or north of Chicago at the time, so. The sun wasn't up yet, so my parents would wake me up and sit me down in front of our old black and white TV with the had a little um, kind of cloth mesh thing over the uh, the speaker, and I mm-hmm. used to lay there and I'd push my feet into. I still remember I'd and they never yelled at me. I don't know why, but I'd lo- I love to kind of massage that speaker with my feet, and just knowing that this was something totally unique. I mean, I you know. I have vague memories of actually going to a friend's house to watch John Glenn's launch, but I remember the uh, later launches of Gemini and certainly the Apollo. And of course, Apollo, they'd they'd wheel a big, what seemed like a big TV, which was probably like a 19-inch TV, into the classroom, and we'd all watch the takeoff or we'd watch the landings. And it riveted, I think, probably not only me, but a lot of people, uh, you know, my age at that time, because it was you knew that it was. It was a it was a threshold we were going to cross that was something completely different than humans had ever done before. So I think that concept of that, and of course, you know, like any kid, like you want to be a baseball player. I wanted to be an astronaut. It would have been amazing, but I got glasses in third grade, and back then you had to be a pilot. You had to have twenty twenty vision, and now, ironically, when astronauts are on the International Space Station, their vision changes from the <laughs> <laughs> the mm-hmm. microgravity. So they all wear glasses. It, you know, it's just a it's a funny set of circumstances. And, and one of the nice things is that more and more people are getting a chance to go into space, and we're on the threshold of it really, I think, I hope, becoming something for eventually the everyday person to go on a, at least a trip just to get up there and look back at the Earth. So Yeah. As I was reading in the in the introductions for the for the book, you know, the point was made that you know all of this was being achieved just twenty years after the end of World War Two. That at a time where the world was really facing probably one of the worst things that as humans we've ever had to contend with, mm-hmm. that on the other end, 20 years later, that one of the most aspirational things that people have ever done is sort of being achieved. And I think that within that context, it really makes the achievement of putting men on the moon even more consequential. Well, World War II is critical because without World War II, we wouldn't have had the Cold War. And, of course, without mm-hmm. World War I, we wouldn't have had World War II. So, you know, it's this, this progression of that. But the impetus of America and Russia to beat each other to the moon was really what drove the developments at that time. If you look at it now, for example, so Kennedy announced that he wanted America to land a man on the moon and return him safely in 1961. Mm-hmm. Only we had, at that point, we had... 15 minutes of actual space flight time by Alan Shepard. That was the entirety of our experience in space. And we went from 1961 to 1969 to landing a man on the moon and returning him safely. And now the shuttle program ended in 2011. It's now 2019. It's basically that same period of time. And we haven't even been able to launch America anyway, has not been able to launch humans in that same amount of time to get back to square one. Now, mm-hmm. there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm not putting down the NASA or the, the commercial contractors, but what it really shows is how amazing that progression was, how phenomenal the technology and the effort and the resources that were applied to that problem. You know, people always talk about a moonshot. You know, well, we need to treat cancer, um, uh, you know, like a moonshot and mm-hmm. just put everything into it. I think it really demonstrated what humans can do if they really do put all their energy and their resources into into an issue. Um, this, you know, the, the the good and bad of it is that you know it really was this Cold War that pushed it, and landing a man on the moon was kind of secondary to beating the Russians to the moon. <laughs> but in the end, it really doesn't matter because we did it, and the impact, you know, the the. One of the biggest impacts from the whole space program was Bill Anders, astronaut on Apollo 8, took an unscheduled photograph. And I mean, everything is scheduled. Everything they do, you know, blowing their nose is probably scheduled. He took a photograph looking back from as they were coming around the moon on their first pass around the backside of the moon. As they came around the moon, they saw the Earth rise above the surface of the moon. And he grabbed a camera and they all saw it and started filming it in different ways. 
But he'd made that amazing photograph of Earthrise. And I don't think any photograph in the history of everything <laughs> has really changed our perspective on who we are and our place in, in the universe than that image. It showed what a what in reality what a tiny, fragile little planet we live on. And we see what's going on now with climate change and the environment. You know, it, this is a spaceship we live on and we've got a We've got to take care of it better than we have been because we're causing problems, yeah. serious problems. And what's amazing is that as consequential as that accomplishment was, not only for people in the United States, but all over the world, it's pretty much been cast aside to a great, uh, a great degree, as you, you know, so well documented in, in your book that these, that these sites in which for a certain finite period of time was so abuzz with activity and and challenges and that you know they're they're just sort of left there to be reclaimed by time and nature and it really is kind of fascinating that a place that should be remembered with more care and consequence isn't what spurred the idea to go out there and to begin memorializing and photographing these sites? Well, I'd love to tell you that I woke up one morning and had this brilliant idea to go document the old abandoned space launch test and uh, launch and test facilities. But in reality, what you said is right. After Really, after Apollo 11 and 12, we lost it. They didn't even cover Apollo 13's, they didn't even interrupt the, the TV networks to show Apollo 13's TV news conference from the command module. Uh, until Apollo had its problem, and then everyone took interest in it. And they, they ended up canceling the last three Apollo missions before they were begun because a couple things. Budgets, they were, you know, they were pushing technology as far as they could at that point, and human capability. And the odds are that at some point they were going to lose a crew on a mission. Now, they lost the Apollo 1 crew in the tragic fire on, on the launch pad, but... They were, I think they were very concerned. And so it was, you know, but I've always been fascinated by the fact that the public's interest waned as well. I mean, it was the biggest thing that ever happened in the world when they landed on the moon. And merely, you know, a year or so later, it, it, you know, people weren't hardly paying attention. So I got the idea to do this book because I was teaching photography at what was at the time Brevard Community College. It's now Eastern Florida State College, I believe. I got a call from an environment engineer who worked out there, and he had found a dark room in an old office building that hadn't been used for about 10 years, and they were going to remodel it. And he said, you know, I don't know what to do with these chemicals. If you can use them at the college, you can have them, but would you come out and help me decide what to do with them and then dispose of the ones you don't want properly? I said, sure, we can. I'd be glad to. So when I got out there, he said, oh, you know, I, I've— uh, I got to make a stop at the desalinization plant. I got to drop off a water sample. Do you mind? And I said, "No, I was, man, this is Cape Canaveral. I, I grew up, <laughs> you know, watching rockets. I, I don't mind." And, he's, and he said, fortuitously for me, "Oh, well, have you ever seen any of the old pads?" And I said, "I didn't know there were old pads." So he said, oh, "I'll take you to one." So he took me to the Gemini Launch Complex, uh, Complex 19 out there, which had been abandoned after the last Gemini launch, and so it had been there for, it was 1988, over 30 years at that point. If I'm maybe not quite 30 years, I'm doing my math right. Uh, tw over 20 some years. And we pulled up and I got out of the car and I immediately knew that this was something that needed to be documented. It's historic and yet it was being abandoned, in some, re in some cases, good reason. But still, it, it, I felt like somebody you know needed to record this transition and also I knew it would be completely amazing. I mean it was beautiful. The but the challenge for me then was well how do I make this not just another picture of peeling paint? How do I push this mm -hmm. to a different level and do service to the history that occurred here and also tell a, a broad story. So that I knew it was going to be difficult to do but also extremely rewarding. Uh, and then it took me about two years to get permission to do the type of work I wanted to do. I started out calling public affairs and an uh, officer I talked to said, oh yeah, I said, I've got a couple other photographers who want to get some shots. We'll 
we'll hop in a van one day and head out there for a half an hour. And I thought, well, half an hour? I want to do this with an 8x10 camera. It'll take me half an hour to get the tripod and the camera set up. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's not going to work. So I, for a couple of years, certainly not every day, but every time I met somebody that knew somebody who worked out there, I'd say, hey, here, I got this idea. And I finally, ironically, I was getting my hair cut one day because only your hairdresser knows for sure, as they say. <laughs> and he said, his name was George Verge, and he said, hey, what are you doing with your photography these days? And I said, well, I got this idea, you know, that, that I told him. I said, but I, you know, I can't, I can't, I haven't been able to figure out how to get the access I need. I need to go out there and spend hours at a time. And, he's, and he said, oh, I'll get you out there. I said, George, I, I, you know, I know, I'm sure you know some folks out there, but I, I've been working on this for two years, I, you know. And anyway, it turned out he was dating someone in public affairs <laughs> on the Space Center. <laughs> and he said, I'll introduce you to him. You show him and explain what you want to do. And so he did that. And I, I thankfully, that person took note of, of what I want to do and understood that there was value to it. And she said, well, we'll get you out there a couple of times and then we'll kind of see how it goes from there. Well, so I went out a couple times and photographed, and, and I have to be escorted uh, to all these places because they're on NASA sites that have dangerous chemicals and dangerous areas and or Air Force bases that have top security issues. And So after I went out a couple times, I took a bunch of the work in and met with the director of public affairs out there, and uh, he was impressed and said, yeah, this is great, we'll... We'll, we'll help keep doing this. And then I was able to make some contacts with the Air Force and, and work out the, um, the details from, from that point. What's really fascinating about looking at your, your photographs is that so many of the locations and the things that you photograph, you realize how functional so much of that was. That, that really was behind the design of everything. But that despite the fact, despite that fact, there is such beauty, symmetry, shape that is just amazing. That that still came through in the designs of these of these structures. And you know, like you said, you wanted to do more than just photograph peeling paint. But was that something that surprised you when you began photographing that that was there waiting for you? Yeah, I would say it was. And you know, form follows function, so. These, they weren't, you know, they didn't have the time nor the resources nor probably the inclination to design things that were pretty. They were very functional. And the, the thing that's striking is it's this odd mixture of very high-tech things and then very low-tech things, you know, stuff you mm -hmm. could find at the hardware store, things you have in your home or materials that you could find anywhere, coupled with other things that, I, you know, I photograph so many things I have absolutely no idea what they were or what they did. Oftentimes, I would have a an escort who had worked at one of the facilities, and they were usually gracious in explaining things to me, and, and it was fascinating. But yeah, there there the structures themselves. When you you, know, you look at the space launch vehicles and their phenomenal machines and the design of those, and um, the launch pads themselves, you start looking at all the wiring and the cabling and the tubing and the piping and every little detail, and I would think, wow, somebody had to sit down and figure all this stuff out before they even, you know, moved a rocket out to this pad. And it was mind-boggling, that aspect of it. And you have to remember, they, you know, most of that work was literally done with slide rules mm -hmm. for the early, very early programs. You know, they didn't have desktop computers. They had computers, but they were, you know, these engineers were sitting at drafting tables hand-drawing these things. They weren't sitting at a computer. Yeah, that aspect of it. And one of the things that came up, I had an exhibit at the Huntsville Museum of Art in 1994 for the 25th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And there were two exhibits, mine and a, an illustrator who'd worked for NASA, uh, NASA, a man named Renato Mancini, who's a wonderful artist. He talked about his work, and one of the things he said was they would come to him and say, we, we need to, you know, have a illustration of a rocket and the rocket's going to do x y and z you know they tell him what the rocket was, was going to do but they wouldn't tell him what it was going to look like so he had to in his mind make up what this rocket looked like and he said it was fascinating how many times the rocket he drew for them to illustrate whatever proposal this was if not the rocket itself aspects of of what he drew ended up in that rocket which mm -hmm. i think is a great example of life imitating art oh that's um, great now granted rockets are pretty basic things there aren't a lot of 
variations to him, but still, uh, I, th- I thought that was an amazing fact that came out of his uh, his work. When I was looking at your image of uh, one of the Mercury capsules, I was really just staring at it and and going, "Okay, that's why they called it a tin can." Yeah, you know, because yeah. you just look at the, just the 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 material on the exterior and just the little details, and you realize, "Wow, how." Especially compared to now, that is just a you know a metal box with a bunch of wires yep. Yep. that they yeah, send a was... man into the into space with. It is really humbling, and it gives you an appreciation for the challenges and the risks involved in putting somebody into space on a bunch of one of the most powerful rockets in the world at the time. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, again when you look back at the technology they had and the experience we had and what was done in that eight, nine year period, it's truly phenomenal. And a lot of the technology, even in the space shuttle, so the space shuttle was first launched in 1981, the technology from the space shuttle, a lot of it was from the 70s and 60s and even prior. The, I talked with an IBM engineer one, who, one time at a launch and he said that the five main computers, redundant computers on the space shuttle at that time, I think they upgraded them later on, but they were the same computers that they used in B-52 bombers. And hmm. now there's, I'm sure there's variations and things, but the basic architecture was the same. Um, so, and, th- and those were designed in the 40s and 50s, I'm going to assume. You know, so th- this, when you work with that kind of technology, it takes a long time for it to run out of favor, I guess is mm-hmm. what I would say. Well, to tell me about the, the, the photographic process. You, you mentioned that you're using 4 by 5 and so you, you were starting with Fujifilm initially, and eventually you moved to, to other ways of um, capturing some of the images. Is that right? Well, actually, I, initially I started out with 6 by 7 but I then quickly moved to 8 by 10 But then I quickly moved back to 6 by 7 because there was so much. I didn't realize how much was out there. And 8 by 10 was such a slow process and my access was so limited, I realized that if I want to get any amount of this documented, I can't do it with 8x10, which broke my heart on one level. But I will also admit that I'm not the world's best view camera photographer. I have never taken to it the way I have with a reflex camera. So mm-hmm. um, I'd love to tell you that I appreciate that and appreciate being closed off under the dark cloth and being able to focus. But the reality is it just was never my style. So I, 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 I did most of the work with a Pentax 6x7. Fuji um, loaned me a 6x8, which I haven't seen many of those. It was a great camera. It was had a bellows front end and ran off a battery pack. And I love that format. That 6 to 3 to 4 aspect ratio was wonderful. And then I did a, 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 quite a bit of work with a 617 Fuji panorama camera as well. Oh, okay. And, I, and as far as film, to make up for not using... An 8x10 camera, I started shooting with Ektar 25 120 size film, which was, I love that film. One of the things I miss about digital, I, I love digital, and I got into digital very early on, but one of the things that it lacks is, and, and this is good for most people, is the color shift the, that you get from the reciprocity failure of the three different layers. So it would, it would typically shift the shadows. If I was doing very long exposures very early in the morning, so multiple seconds, 15, 30, sometimes two-minute exposures because I wanted a lot of depth of field, and we'd get out there before sunrise and kind of get set up and wait for the sun to come up because a lot of the facilities out there don't have a lot of color in them. They're cement, and cement in the midday is pretty ugly, but at sunrise, it can be very beautiful. So... By using a 25 ISO film, it, that extended those exposures and it extended that reciprocity, the difference in how the different three different layers in the color film fail to be reciprocal. And again, I, I get this lovely blue shift in the shadows. And you can see it in some of the images. The most notable one is um, a catacombs picture of, uh, it's the bowels of a rocket engine test stand at Edward Air Force Base. It's very, very blue. And part of that is, it's all blue sky light reflecting in, but a lot of it is also that long exposure shift. And then they quit making that in about oh, 1997 or 98, I think, and uh, shifted to other films, low, still low ISO. But the 25 ISO film gave me really quite fine grain. So I'm doing work now scanning these images in. I, I had some of that wanted to buy one 
I think I, I think it was 48 inches, and I w- I'm able to, with the right software and the right processing, make a print that holds up from a medium format negative. So I've, I've been happy with that. Yeah, because I look at some of those pictures, and, I, and a lot of them, I want to see them big. Because yeah. I just want to get so immersed yeah. in them. I mean, the book is wonderful. I like the, the large format, but it's like some of those photographs just beg to be like 40 yeah. by 60. Yeah. Well, I've just started working with Topaz software. I don't know if you've heard yeah. of that. Or, mm-hmm. And they just have come out with some really amazing grain reduction and noise uh, noise reduction and, and uh, sharpening software that's using artificial intelligence. And I just, before we talked, started talking, processed an image that was quite blurred. And I was, I'm just thrilled with the, the possibilities of that software. So. Well, you mentioned before that you know, you're, you had limited access to some of these locations. And I can imagine that you walk onto these places and there's just a wealth of stuff that you could photograph in any myriad of, of ways. The project is more than just trying to create aesthetically pleasing looking photographs. Along with that, you're, you're considering the historical, historical significance of that, of that space. So when, you know, you, you, come to a location, have you already researched where you want to go, or are you discovering it on the fly as you're walking around? It's a combination. So I'd, I would do quite a bit of research, and with the advent of the internet, it made it a lot easier. It was harder um, prior to that, but I could look at the facility, look at any photographs, try to determine what structures I wanted to photograph. But then it's always, a, you know, it's really about responding to what to what you see, so, mm-hmm. and I, the approach that I have taken uh, with this project is a little bit unique in the fact that it's it's kind of a hybrid between a documentary project and more of a fine art abstract project, which people gave me a lot of grief at first about, but I I, I pushed through, and I'm really glad I did because I think it tells a broader story, and it's the images are more interesting, and it does a better job actually documenting what's there in ways that official government photographs, which there are thousands mm-hmm. of of these sites, don't do it and really can't do. That's not their that's not their purpose. You don't have many portraits or, or images of people in there. But there is one image of a commemoration of Apollo One. And I was really emotionally moved by that photograph and looking at it because I think that that single photograph I thought for me encapsulated the entire project because in that one image you have the context of the space and how it is aging and deteriorating and then also the activity that was revolving around that that that, that location at the time and the the loss of those three astronauts due to that that fire and the fact that you have these three people not including you who's photographing it that are remembering the sacrifice that was made. And as time has passed, has taken less and less significance with the general general public. And I felt like, I, I just stared at that image and it felt like, as simple as it was, it really spoke to everything you were trying to achieve with, with, with the project. It's Aesthetically, it's a beautifully composed photograph, but within the context of what that moment not only that moment, but just the entire story is about. It was a really surprisingly touching image amidst all, the entire body of work. And I was hoping that you could flush out what that moment was like for sure. you. Sure, sure. Well, there are only four photographs with people in the, in the entire book, and that was certainly not the focus. But I, I wanted to start each chapter about the manned launch programs, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, with a portrait of someone because it was really about people in the end. So I did that. The picture you're referring to of the memorial ceremony for the Apollo 1 fire, I had been working with a gentleman named Johnny Johnson who was kind of the commander in charge of facilities. He was a civilian. He'd been a colonel in the Air Force um, out there. And he said uh, at one point, he said, you know, I've got to introduce you to Mark Pinchel and Bob Castro who have a ceremony every year for the Apollo 1 fire. And so in 1994, I went out and met with them, and it was just Bob and his mother and Mark and Johnny and myself. And Johnny's not in the photograph. He was off behind us. And he has, Johnny escorted us out there. It was a just a really, just played some music and said a few words, and it was nothing fancy and very simple and mm-hmm. 
straightforward. And it was just a really beautiful remembrance of the, you know, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee, the three astronauts that died in the Apollo 1 fire. And I included it in the book because of what you said. I felt like it was important to the story, even though it was different than all the other photographs, because of that sense. And what's what came from that ceremony was three years later, Mark and Bob planned a 30th anniversary ceremony uh, on, in 1997, and they invited all the astronaut families. And at that point, no one was, that was the most, it wasn't a public service, but that was the most formal ceremony that anyone was holding. NASA wasn't doing anything. The Air Force wasn't doing anything formal. And so Bob and, and Mark put together this ceremony invited astronaut families and got different astronaut speakers even got a missing man flyover and it was it was a it was on the national news it was a big deal and then from that then the air force and nasa kind of took it over and every year really the air force now has had a ceremony out there it's really for friends and family and it's they've Mm -hmm. actually cut it back down to family just this past year which is i think is a good thing because it you know it's a very it doesn't need to be a public ceremony at this point. But I thought it was very impressive that two private individuals with no direct connection to the space program really got this whole remembrance going of one of what was, you know, one of the most pivotal moments in, in our space program. Yeah. And the other images of the, the twins, Harold and Carol yeah. Collins. Yeah. And, you know, one served as a janitor and one was another one was an assistant to the director. And I, I thought that that was just another great image to include because so, so much so much we think about the astronauts. And yep. it was just like, no, there were people in every position, in every role, from janitorial services to the engineers to the technicians to, you know, and, and that all of those people took uh, an inherent pride to what they were contributing t- to the program, regardless of how nominal the the job may have seemed to others. Yeah. That, that I think that the few people who I've talked to who actually worked in, in any of these programs, when you talk to them about their contribution, they you can hear it in their voice of how, how that was such an important part of their lives and it gave it so much significance and meaning. Yeah. Harold and Carol are, are just wonderful people. I knew them because they were custodians in my building at the college and got to talking to them and hearing their stories about working out there. And I thought, boy, I need to, you know, this is just as much a part of the story. And there were African-Americans and other minorities that had broader roles, engineering and administration and things. But but that, you know, I think it'd be disingenuous. And I think we often see pictures of those people. But the reality was, at that point, and thankfully it's changed, but at that point in time, the majority of minorities had, and I I will never use the term menial jobs because my first job out of college was as a janitor. (laughs) If you want to see an institution or an organization come to a screeching halt, run out of toilet paper. (laughs) So I I have, you know, much respect for every job. But roles that were less visible— less technical, the tr- you know, people in the trades. So I thought it was important to say these people were a part of this, and I hope that it's a bit of a comment on that time, and, and hopefully we see that change continue. But they were uh, just wonderful people. I'll tell you a quick story. I had a Miata. I was living in Florida. It was my – I had my midlife crisis when I was 30, which was probably good because <laughs> I wasn't married. And uh, I pulled into – work one night and they were out front and they said oh what a cool car and I, and I made some quick offhanded comment about it not being clean and two days later they're out in the hallway smiling big guy what's going on they go oh, come here they had washed my car those guys had on their own time mm. washed my car and I like that story because they understood that I respected them it wasn't about them washing my car because I couldn't get my car washed it was the fact that they understood that I respected them and what they did so I love those guys, and I'm really glad I got to put them in the book. It's conversations like these that make me appreciate what I do. I not only get to see and discover the great work that's being done today by some of the world's best photographers, but I also get the chance to sit down and talk with them for an hour. How lucky am I? 
I did much the same thing when I was writing articles on photographers for magazines, but the difference was that only a fraction of our conversation would find their way onto the page. Because of the limitations of space, there was so much that had to be left out. But I don't have to worry about word counts and, and time restrictions here. It's all there, and I know the show is the better for it. That's why I'm so grateful to you for helping me to make these conversations available in their entirety. It's been your enthusiasm and support that has carried me through these many years and has allowed me to do something that I truly love doing. So if you love what we do here and you want to help make it even better, become a Patreon supporter and commit to a reoccurring donation of $5 or more a month. Your support, especially over the past six months, has been invaluable to me, especially since I've dedicated the majority of my time to producing the show. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candor frame or click on the link in the show notes or the candor frame website. Thanks. Well, another project that you worked on was uh, what you call interior spaces, where you worked with an Italian uh, astronaut, Paolo Naspoli. That's correct. You say it better than I can. That's okay. Right. <laughs> and uh, he was he was on the International Space Station, and he had some experience as a photographer. But t- tell us about that co- collaboration. Because it, is, it is one of the most unique photographic collaborations I've ever heard about. Yeah, it's. I'm still still working on the on the project and processing some images, and we're working on a book right now. So I had a, a, about 30, I think, of the abandoned place images on display in the astronaut crew quarters at the Kennedy Space Center, which is where the astronauts stay when they're training or before they go up on missions. And I got a call from an astronaut named Katie Coleman, and I, of course I was at a conference, so the only time an astronaut ever called me, and I don't, I'm not there to get it. But she left a message and said, well, I'm up in the crew quarters, and I just want to tell you I really like this work, and my husband is a glass artist. Her husband is a, a gentleman named Josh Simpson, who's a very good glass artist. You know, the, 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 the visual arts were a big part of their life, and she was just really appreciative. So when I got back, I called her back out there, and she had already gone back to Houston. So I never did catch up to her, really. Uh, fast forward to 2014, I went down to photograph the launch, the test launch of the Orion capsule, and she was one of the astronauts that NASA sent down to meet with the press. So I introduced myself to her, and she remembered the work, and she said, you know, I wish there was a way we could get your photographic approach and vision to the astronauts on the International Space Station. She said, think about, think about how you could do that. And, of course, I'm like, well, <laughs> twist my arm. I'll think about that. And I, so I thought about it, and I thought— I did a little research on Katie, and she, she's a flute player, and she had three flutes up on the International Space Station while she was up there. And she'd play them in the cupola, which is the seven-windowed observation port up there late at night. Paolo talked about how wonderful it was to hear her playing her flute, and you know, mm-hmm. could waft through the station at night. But she had done a, a concert with Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull. She'd done a duet, not a full concert, but a duet with him. He was performing at a concert in Russia, for the uh, anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's very first space launch, the very first human space launch. So they did duet while she was on the station and he was at that concert. And that made me think, well, you know, maybe I could do something like that. So, uh, so I put together this very complex plan to tether a DSLR to a laptop and cast the image back to Earth where I could direct the astronaut through the station and da 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 And Katie liked it, you know, so she said, but... The only way this is going to work is if we can get an astronaut to agree to work with you because that it's mm-hmm. you know that'll that'll. I said okay, so I want to connect you with Paolo Nespoli, who I was on the station with. He's a really good photographer and he's uh, a really good person. So I thought okay. So a couple of days later, I was in some boring meeting at the college. I shouldn't say that, but and my phone rang and it said Houston. I thought well that I better. So I stepped out and took it and and it was Paolo and he he said hey can you Skype with me? I said sure. So I left my meeting and went up to my office and Skyped with him. And he was so gracious. He's such a wonderful person. He's, he very politely said, first, first thing he did was he talked about how he felt like, you know, 
we should be sending artists and poets and writers and painters into space. He said, but, you know, obviously we, that's not where we're at yet, but someday. So he, he made it clear that he understood what was important about this project. And the proposal on the project was to document the interior of the space station in a similar way that I've been documenting both the uh, abandoned launch sites and then I, I've done a project on the space shuttle as well. He said, it, and you, he said everything you proposed would work. He said, but uh, you know, you'd need a com link and a video link and a data link, and, and and he said most of all you'd need astronaut time, which I knew would be tricky. He, he said, and I, my heart sank at that point because he, he said, but he goes, I think it's such a good idea that I'm willing to use my personal time to do this. I said, really? And he said, and instead of doing all the uh, complex, he didn't phrase it this way, but I'll say it this way: the complex menagerie of things I proposed. He said, why don't we just email pictures back and forth? And I thought, well, well, that's great. So we agreed to do it. We talked about it. I did some testing with a friend, Mark Francis, uh, photographing some space articles at the National Naval Avi Aviation Museum. And I came up with kind of a code for marking the cropping and moving and angles and eye lines so that I could very precisely tell Paula what to photograph. And then I went down to Houston and photographed their the space uh, station mock-up they have that's laid out very much as the original is. It's very low fidelity, but it, it's the same shape and size to get an idea of the lighting and lenses. And, and while I was down there, the, my escort <laughs> said, you know, we're releasing a Google Street Map view of the interior of the station in two days. <laughs> my mom uh, would, would very lovingly say to me all the time, you have more luck than sense, and this is a really good example <laughs> of that case. So I went. He actually gave me a, access a day early to it, and I went and looked. And I because I thought, oh great, I'll be able to see what's there. And but then I quickly realized, oh no, I can do screen captures of what's there. And they had, the good news was they had just shot this in March and April of 2017. Apollo was going up the end of July 2017. So things always change and move around on the station, but. Um, I knew that uh, things would be generally the same. So that's what I did. I was able to make screen captures, and then I'd send those to Paolo, and I, we eventually ended up with a spreadsheet and notes, and, and he did a fantastic job. He's a very good photographer on his own. He's taken some amazing photographs as well. He, uh, in fact, shot, if you saw the show, um, One Strange Rock, he did the uh, photography of Peggy Whitson with the red video camera up there. Mm -hmm. And he, if you have an Apple TV and you have see the screensaver shots from the space station yeah. that they have on there, he shot about 98% of that stuff. So he's oh, a really he? oh, okay. um, amazing photographer in his own right. And it was great to work with, and we got some really interesting images. It's it's fun. It's a little bit different than Abandoned Place, and it's different than the shuttle, but the, the purpose of it was, they you know, they take pictures inside the station, but they're generally of people doing things or the experiments, and they take a lot of pictures outside the station. Paolo said he took over half a million pictures on in, in five months. Now, a lot of that was time-lapse photography, yeah. so it, it sounds like a little bit more, but still, they take an immense amount of pictures. So doing something that they're not already doing was a challenge. And that's why I thought, well, if I photograph the interior, and the, the purpose is that someday that space station will you know, be abandoned and deorbited and burn up in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and be gone. So it's, there's going to be, I, I, unless they can figure out a way to bring a module or two back, I don't know if they can, but odds are that's not, not feasible. So, Well, t talk to me about the, the practical nature of photographing in space because this thing is it's not there static it's moving in orbit yeah. around the planet and god knows what what's the rate of speed and you know there's microgravity involved and you know you can't just put a monopod in there and expect it to be right the most right. reliable thing in terms of producing a sharp photograph so what did you guys have to figure out in order to make sure that the quality was there well there's a number of things so you're right if space station's traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, you have faced things like, uh, initially when Apollo was shooting, I would get files back and there would be bad pixels because of so, uh, radiation. Mm. Camera radiation burns out the pixels. If you fly in an aircraft a lot, it can damage your, the sensors and your cameras 
as well. But this is much more dramatic. In fact, they replaced the cameras regularly. He was shooting with D4s initially, and they got the first set of uh, Nikon D5s up there um, while he was on board. So uh, initially, I'd I'd look at the pictures and I'd say, oh, and I could look up in the uh, metadata what, what the serial number of the camera was, and I'd say, all right, you know, avoid using camera serial number such and such, mm. and then and then from then on, it was fine. It worked out. But, but the the thing that became immediately clear to me was that a tripod was not going to work in a weightless environment. Now I shoot most of my work on a tripod at again very slow speeds to get as much depth of the field, a very small aperture, and because the the detail in these is is very important to me. And I knew I'd have to, you know, give a little bit of that up. And what I tested when I went down to photograph the mock-up was I was shooting, because it has the same exact lighting as they have on the station, although they were transitioning from fluorescent to um, LED. I think they had transitioned the majority of the station by the time Paolo was there. I thought we'd have to shoot at like 3200 ISO and just handhold the camera. And so I was shocked when I got the first batch of images back and Paolo had shot them at 100 ISO and they were at like a fifth of a second. And they were all tack sharp. And I said, huh, you know, how, how did you do this? And he, well, he figured out a way to, they have these armatures that they put laptops and different equipment on. They're mm -hmm. made by Manfrotto. And they just, it's just a articulated arm. And he figured out a way to hook two of them together on a camera. And that was enough to stabilize it. He said one of them wouldn't work because even though it's weightless, th there's a harmonic vibration to the station just because mm -hmm. it's so big. So, it, they're, they're, but it, but with two, it worked. So his again, he was the right person for this because he did stuff that I didn't even consider. And it took a you know it took a lot more time. As it turned out, he spent some of his last hours shooting handheld just to get a bunch more stuff, and that was at a higher higher ISO. And so I'm in the process of trying to make all those images match up technically as much as I can by reducing the grain and, mm. and increasing the sharpness of some of those. But he did a fantastic job. I was looking at some of those images, and there's one that he shot from the cupola, the observation yeah. place. And I look at a lot of photographs, and I was looking at my iPad, and I came upon that image. And out loud I said, oh, my God. Yeah. And... I don't do that very often, yeah. but a, I looked at that photograph and it was just stunningly beautiful. And I think part of the reasons why it evoked such a strong emotional reaction for me was that it was the context of that space, in not just the geometry and the way it sort of frames the planet in, in, in the background, but I had sort of a context of, of how I would have been in that space and observing the planet. And I just kind of, it allowed me to project myself there looking at it in a way that I, I haven't had when I've just looked at a photograph of, you know, of the planet or I've observed like people doing those EVAs uh, on, on the space shuttle. There was just something about that photograph that just pulled me in immediately. And it really was an image that really left me dumbstruck. It is so, so stunning. Well, you know, that was one of the images I sent, not that particular one, but that composition from the Google Street View. And the Google Street View is pretty. It's, it's got some land and some water. And, there, uh, you know, in, in one of the first things I did before I even went to Houston to photograph the mock-up was I spent, I think, 100, 150 hours online looking at images and videos, trying to get familiar with the interior of the station so I would know where things were and I would know what to photograph and know what to be interested in. I just wanted to be as familiar with it as I could. So I looked at a lot of images shot from the cupola, and there are many beautiful images, but that one is certainly one of the more stunning ones. So Paolo and I, um, when he came back, we met up uh, at the uh, National Trust for Historic Preservation, and I had a chance to talk to him face-to-face -face for the first time, and I said, you know, did you wait for those cloud patterns to appear uh, in that picture? Because... They are phenomenal. He said, no. He said, the cupola is really busy. He says, you've got to get in there, do your work, and get out. There's somebody else waiting mm. to get in. He said, I, I just that's just what was there. So, again, more luck than sense, as my mom said. But <laughs> it, and the thing I think that makes it extra special image is the lighting and the, and the cloud patterns, but also that circular window references the, the earth itself, you know, just as if that was the earth itself with 
clouds and water. So, it, you know, the, I agree with you. It's a, it's a breathtaking, and I was thrilled that, you know, I think the project, to be honest with you, was worth that one image. Yeah. Uh, to me, anyway. I would, I would been, if that's all we'd gotten, I would have been satisfied. So, What's the most gratifying response that you've gotten from people who have seen the work, either in exhibits or because of the book? It's a combination of things. I think people like the fact that I'm documenting this history and the passing of this history. And also they like my use of color and design. You know, I'm old school when it comes to that. I got into photography because I love the medium. I mean, I loved light. I loved color. I, I love the, the way you could take a photograph of an inanimate object and tell a story and give, you know, give someone a reaction like you had to, to that cupola picture. And that, if you can do that with someone... That's amazing. And then if you add people and you can, you know, do even more. I, I, I don't do a lot of portraiture, but um, it's on my bucket list to, to do some, pro- and I don't know what it is, but someday do a big documentary or, or a big portraiture project. So I think it's, I think it's a combination of the, the photographic part of it, if that makes sense, the artistic mm-hmm. part of it, and the history, which is good because one of, one of my favorite things about especially like the abandoned place work, it attracts a lot of different viewers. It attracts people who are interested in photography. It attracts people who are interested in art in general. It attracts people who are interested in technology and and space exploration. And so if you can make imagery work on a number of different levels, it gets a broader audience and impacts more people. And I think that's, that's a noble goal. It doesn't always work, certainly for me, but that's often my, my end goal. Yeah. You know, your, your career has been that of a, of, a, of a photo educator. And, you know, you've been working on this project for, for, for 30 years. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things uh, about working on something for that, that long is, is sustaining it. Not, mm-hmm. not just financially, but just finding the time. Because, yeah. you know, the, the demands of life can easily derail a lot of projects, mm-hmm. not least of which is something that is so demanding. The sites aren't going anywhere, for the, but still, you have to be able to create the opportunities to for you to actually photograph them. So, tell us about how that fit into you know the the day to day of your of your normal life. Well, it was uh, a lot of my spring breaks were spent <laughs> photographing at NASA sites. That was pretty much it. I had this kind of dual life where uh, in the summers I was a forest ranger in the Sawtooth National Recreation Area for 18 seasons. And so I couldn't leave that job typically to go do any photography. So I had breaks in school or I would take a little, I really couldn't take time off per se. But when I became an administrator, I had a little bit more freedom to take vacation time because I wasn't as tied to the class schedule. But yeah, you know, it's you just do what you can. And sadly, the sites are going places. About about 50% of the photographs, not the photographs, but the facilities I photographed in the book are gone now. They've been oh, wow. torn down and repurposed for other things. Uh, you know, there, there, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of those old towers had lead paint on them and it was oxidizing into soil. They'd have to do remediation on the soil to clean that up. Um, uh, they needed to make way for new things like Complex 13. I have a, a lot of photographs of it. It was uh, an Atlas complex on Cape Canaveral. Uh, if you saw the stunning photographs or video of the two SpaceX rockets landing next to each other, mm-hmm. yeah, that's Complex 13 now. Now it's called Landing Zone 1 and 2, but that, was, that flat spot there was where Complex 13 was, so it's gone. Yeah. And the reality is, even when I started photographing those old launch pads, most of them, all of them, really were were too far gone to save. They were so rusted. There was just there was no way you could do any sort of restoration work without spending tens of millions of dollars, basically rebuilding them from scratch. Which is a shame because it you know you look at all the Civil War battlefields across the country that are preserved, which is great, and they're usually literally just fields, so it's a lot easier to preserve them than a steel mm-hmm. structure right next to the ocean. But it's a big part of our history. The, the Cold War was a war, even though we weren't shooting guns at each other. We were kind of shooting missiles over each other. To lose the tangible artifacts of that, we have the capsules and we have the spacesuits and things in museums, but that's never going to be the same as standing 
on the spot where these vehicles took off. Mm-hmm. And I consider myself very privileged to have, have done that over and over again. So the other aspect of it, though, the practicality is most of them are on top-secret military bases or very secure facilities where you can't just dump people off and let them wander around. It, you know, it's not a, there's not a practical way to preserve them or put the money into preserving them and then let people visit them. So it's just a, it, it's kind of a, the story's been written and there's there's no way to end it otherwise, I don't, I don't think, certainly at this point, because yeah. most of the steel structures on the old pads at Cape Canaveral are, are long gone. One of the Im- interesting images f- for me were the small details. Like you have one of the Scout uh, Accountability Board, mm-hmm. where I guess they had these tags on different facets of the launch. And then when the technician uh, had finished checking it, they would take it off and then they would put it on this board. Yeah, yeah. And it was really fascinating to think about the, the, the people who, for the very last time, put those tags on there and then just walked away. Yeah. And yeah. then you kind of rediscovered them, God knows how much time. Yeah. Afterwards, but it, it, it gave me the feeling of like the ghosts yeah. that are sort of wandering there. The evidence of, I mean, the structures themselves are evidence of the human activity there, but those small little details, uh, I think, make that, that even more vivid. Well, there, you know, there were a lot of things like that too, that whether they were stickers or signs or remnants of someone's desk or papers or whatever it might be that told kind of the human side of that story. I, I like what you said about that, thinking about the last person to hang those up, the remove before flight tags. You know, one of the interesting things that um, doing the space shuttle work was I was, I photographed, I had photographed the space shuttle a fair amount before, but the last five years I did a very concentrated effort to document it. And I was photographing the decommissioning of the orbiters. And one day, uh, I think it was, in, I was photographing Endeavor and, the spacecraft operator who was with me, who was my escort, came up to me. He said, "Well, we, we, you know, we just took the oxygen supply system out, so I guess the patient stopped breathing." Mm. And he was being funny, but it hit me right at that point. Like, wow! So here are these people that worked on these orbiters their entire career, some of them thirty years, twenty-five, thirty years, doing everything they could do to keep them in pristine shape, mostly to protect the lives of the astronauts, but also to have successful missions. Mm-hmm. And now they were being asked to dismantle them. I thought, that must be so hard. That must be one of the hardest things that you know you can do. It's just like reversing your career and everything you worked for. I just, I, I had so much respect because they weren't complaining about it, but it hit me that, you know, that human factor, even though I'm photographing mechanical and technical things, I hope that that is coming through because that also is one of the points. Yeah. It's one of the reasons why I like, I like that portrait that you did of Gunter Wendt, mm. who was uh, the last face that the astronauts would see before the capsule was sealed. And I thought about just just that, you know, that, that relationship between him and the various astronauts who he looked at before they closed the, the, the yeah. capsule is just like as, as a monumental a technological effort that all of this was that human connection mm. at that last moment where all the hopes of everything going well are there but there's also the suggestion that this may be yeah the last moment that this yeah. that this person's on earth and then that i just i it just gave me a little sort of sense of chills when i thought about that uh, and the fact that he was sort of there for so many of those launches they had uh a lot of jokes that went back and forth between the White Room crew, especially Gunter and the astronauts, where they'd have little signs or they gave him a German helmet. They used to call him the Pad Fuhrer in jest <laughs> because he was German. He, he, he was in the German Air Force during World War II, but immigrated here afterwards. He was not part of the Operation Paperclip scientists, I think sometimes people think. But Gunter was just an amazing, amazing person and brilliant and funny and he talked about when we were in when I was photographing in the right room white room he talked about when they'd be in there all the different contractors would have their their company's logo like Boeing or Lockheed or whatever the uh, Rockwell whatever the company was at the time and whenever he, there were cameras in the white room so whenever he'd uh, talk to him he put his arm around people's back and cover up like he was being nice, but he was actually covering up the <laughs> covering up the logo from the other company. <laughs> just a you know, just 
just a wonderful person and, and had a tremendous impact. You could tell that the astronauts respected him, and that was important because of exactly what you said. He, mm-hmm. he was in charge of everything that went on on the pad, and that was a critical part in the mission. If the launch didn't work, you know, th- there were big, big problems. So they, he was the right person at the right time. In fact, they changed the contract between Gemini and Apollo, and he was it was a different company, and he wasn't there. And after the Apollo 1 fire, they, you know, I think NASA made them mm. hire him and put him back in there. So not, you know, not that he could have stopped that fire, but, you know, I think it was partly to reassure the astronauts, hey, we got, you know, Gunter's back, your guy's back. He was a yeah. great guy. I hope someday to, to take a look at The Prince, because it's, it's amazing that the book looks. I, I'm sure that The Prince looked fantastic. And I was seeing on your site that you have a thing called the tone system. Yeah. Yeah. And can you talk briefly in terms of, yeah. what, of what that is and, and what role it plays in terms of you creating the print? So I, I, I did a lot of color printing. When I was in college, I worked at the uh, uh, university. I went to Utah State University. I worked at the university's um, service lab. So they provided photography and, and prints for all the different departments around the campus. Uh, and I, I started out printing black and white, but then I shifted, they shifted me over to color. And so... And this was back when, if you were a student, you had a little, you know, roller drum. Uh, but there, I had this big Crenite processor, so I really learned. I printed. I could print a lot more. I'd work on four or five enlargers at once and move around as they were going through the processor. So I learned how to print color and see color from that. And I worked at a commercial lab in Chicago when I was in. Uh, I guess it was the summer between freshman and sophomore year called Color Graphics. I'm not sure if they're still around. They moved out to the suburbs. Great. And they did only commercial photography work. They did the the big 10 by 110 foot transparency that's, uh, I don't know if it's it's probably not still there, but it was in Penn Station. Uh, Oh, yeah. Every Mm -hmm. six weeks, we would print that and they'd go out and put it up. They were having trouble with everything. And I'm getting to the tone system, but this is an important point of it. They were having trouble that all the prints, everything they were getting was getting published that they, we processed was was like 20 to 30 points too yellow. And I was film processing, so they had me checking the specific gravity of stuff and doing all that, and everything was dead on, and they couldn't figure it out. So they called a, 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 a consultant in from Kodak, and he walked in, and this, the color correction area was on the second floor. He walked upstairs. He looked. He goes, is this your color correcting booth? They said, yeah. He looked at the room. He looked at the wall across the room, which was painted just a light blue. And he goes, paint that. Get a get a you know couple gallons of Munsell gray. Paint that paint that wall gray. You'll be fine. <laughs> and they did, and it, and it worked. And I thought, wow, this color stuff is so technical and so specific. And you got, yeah. you know it's just it, it, that I was fascinated at that point. I thought, wow, this is so. This is you know this is so much deeper than I could have imagined it. And the fact, you know, we'd spent a month trying to figure out what was going on. Fast forward to grad school, I did my work in color photography, which in the early 1980s was still pretty unusual. And I just, I just loved color. It was always my thing. Although I work in black and white, I taught the zone system for years. Big fan of it. Got involved in digital imaging through a friend, Denny Defabaugh at RIT, who, um, introduced me to another gentleman, Douglas Ford Ray, who was teaching some of the first classes. And I went to one of his workshops that their technical and education center put on and uh, fell in love with it. This, you know, it was great. And then started going to other pla- other classes and took a number with um, a gentleman named Eric Kenley, who was uh, in the printing industry, but he was teaching digital, not really digital photography, but kind of the basics of digital. And so from some of the processes he taught, I took them and applied them more to photography and developed what I call the tone system. And it's called that because you adjust the white point or the white tone and the black point or the black tone and the quarter tone and the mid tone and the three quarter tone on the curve in Photoshop. But I also call it that as a nod to Ansel Adams, of course, mm-hmm. and the, the amazing zone system. And it's a, it's a process by where you can pretty quickly adjust a color image in Photoshop and get the color right on by using the eyedropper and the info palette and neutrals. And, and it gives, it's a little too complex to explain in great detail, but I have it on the website if, if anybody wants to look at it. And the other thing that, that came about from that was back in the day when there weren't a lot of 
high-end inkjet printers, I had an Epson 4000, and I printed up uh, some prints for a faculty show, and my mid-tones were really magenta, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it, you know. Now, you could buy a, a third-party software rip, but their color lookup tables for the color on those just wasn't up to par. Thankfully, they've gotten a lot better. So I had a, 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 a colleague that had owned a printing, a digital printing place, so I had him print it, and he printed it, and he got the new drop, but then my shadows were blocked up. And I sent him the same exact file. I thought, well, what's what? How can that be? So I started looking into the black point and realized that different papers and different ink combinations can maintain, much like with the, the tone system in you know, black and white photography, you've got to get the right amount of information in the digital file like you would into a negative. Mm-hmm. And instead of changing the film developing time to change the negative, here you just adjust the the white and black point. And so I developed a couple of, of white and black point targets, which again, you can download for free on the website, that allow you to test any printer and ink combination. So you print those out with whatever print ink combination profile uh, setting you have, and they will give you a really good idea. And it's a visual check. It's not a, it's you, where you can see the separation in the blacks right. and where you can see the separation in the whites. Now, digital printers have gotten a lot better and the white points don't seem to vary too much these days, but I still you still get variation in the black a little bit depending on what you're doing. So, but I can I can put an image into that and adjust it if I set my neutral point eyedroppers and look at the info palette. I can adjust the color without looking at the without looking at the color in the image and be pretty darn if I've got good neutrals, be right on. You know, I always when I do workshops and things, I always ask people what's the most important thing to cali- to uh, profile your camera your monitor or your printer and you know what everybody says almost everybody says they say your monitor everybody says cal which is not a bad thing it's good to yeah. calibrate your monitor but my first response is how many people see your monitor how many <laughs> how many people see your print you know yeah. you you, you got to cal- you got to profile your printer you've got to do that and, and again they have really good profiles and it's it's gotten a lot easier to to do these days but in a nutshell Okay, I, I'm not going to look for look forward to playing with that. But my last question is yeah. the question I ask each guest, and I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it, it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? I'm going to um, tell you to uh, take a look at a gentleman named Todd Birdley, who's actually a good friend of mine. He's a... Uh, landscape photographer, documentary photographer, has done some amazing work, had a book uh, called Crescent Rivers, published on the river systems and the crescent of the Panhandle of Florida, panoramic work. Um, Also has an amazing series called Autographics, where he, uh, taking from the old autographic camera where you could write into the negative and it would then print out, he's actually writing kind of personal histories on these photographs of the tie in the South and some of his family history and other things are really amazing. Guggenheim Fellow winner. Uh, I think he's the, one of the most overlooked photographers working today. So I think he'd be a, a good one for your viewers to check out. It's, well, thank you so much for your work, for sharing your book with me, and for making the time for us. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for taking the time with me. I appreciate it. Thanks to Roland for sharing his time and story with us. You can find out more about him and his work by visiting his website at abandoninplace.com. And I'll be in Washington, D.C. in late May for the Focus on the Story Photographic Conference. The International Photo Festival will feature some of the world's best photojournalists and documentary photographers, as well as talks, photo walks, and workshops of which I am teaching one. If you want to sign up for my workshop or you just want to find out more about the event, visit focusonthestory.org. And remember to check out my YouTube channel where I discuss different aspects of photography by pulling images from listeners like you who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr Pool. You can find out about the TCF Flickr Pool and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes and the website. My new book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. 
In it, I translate how to see and use light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture to make great photographs. It's more than how to make a good picture, but how you can develop a personal and intimate way of seeing and documenting the world around you. You can order the book today. When you place your order from the Rocky Nook website, use the promo code PORELLO40 to receive 40% off the list price. Check out the website in the show notes for the link. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frames, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. And if you like what you've been hearing on the show, please take the time to write a review in the iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play Store or wherever you find and listen to your podcast. And if you write a review on a blog post, let me know and send me a link because I would really like to thank you on air. Thanks to Dean Tate, Victor Zong, and Photo 2013 for their five-star reviews. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Brian J. Lewis, Josh Alvarado, Ryan Hafmeister, and Matt Grun for their recent contributions. I really love you guys. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download The Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. Download it today. You'll find it where everything else is, in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. And we also have an Alexa app. So if you have one of those smart devices, download The Candid Frame skill and listen to the show that way. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor. You can find it at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at X. And this is X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>